2017, and we join him in his office here in College Park, Maryland, in the Frack Hall, where he holds the chairmanship of the Department of Criminal, uh, Criminology and Criminal Justice at the University of Maryland. Uh, before we get into the substance of his life and his career, just a bit, bit a brief brack background on his life and some of his accomplishments to give um, those who aren't familiar, who aren't uh, fortunate enough to be familiar with uh, either Lynch personally or with his work, a little bit of an insight into in terms of um, his importance and his contributions to the field. Jim began his uh, scholarly work in 1971, earning a BA from Wesleyan University in sociology, continuing down the sociolo sociology path, earned his MA from the University of Chicago in 1975, pursuing a PhD, earning that in 1983, also from the University of Chicago. The dissertation entitled Community Organization and the Delivery of Police Services, and the chairman of that uh, effort was Charles Bidwell. So held a variety of academic positions over the course of his career. Uh, we'll summarize. He worked from assistant professor to uh, full professor, starting as an assistant at American University in 1986, having been named full professor in 1997, uh, where he stayed until 2005, uh, working his way to New York City and John Jay College of Criminal Justice in 2005, where he remained until 2010. 2010. Uh, also served as distinguished professor at John Jay College of Criminal Justice from 2006 to 2010. At that point, he came to the uh, segued into governmental back into governmental work, uh, working for the uh, having been named the director of the Bureau of Justice Statistics in 2010. Served there until 2013. Uh, nominated by Barack Obama. I suppose that took about a year or so from the nomination <laughs> until the uh, until the uh, b uh, having uh, that bestowed. Uh, in 2013, he came to back into academic life here at the University of Maryland, uh, where he chairs the department and has chaired the department since 2013. Uh, he's also chaired a number of other departments, American University as well, uh, actually one other department, American University, the Department of Justice, Law, and Society from 1997 to 2005. Uh, in terms of his contributions to the scholarship of the field, uh, oversaw as co-editor the Journal of Quantitative Criminology from 2008 to 2010. He's also served in a number of editorial positions and roles throughout his career as well. Dozens and dozens of advisory panels and committees over the course of the years at uh, various levels of government um, and uh, private and public service. Uh, his vita is filled with those uh, acknowledgments. Uh, he's earned a number of honors and awards uh, summarizing uh, from the list, he was named Visiting Fellow, Bureau of Justice Statistics in 1993, served as Visiting Chair, hopefully I get this name right, the Federal University of Minas Gerais, Minas Gerais. Gerais in Brazil in tw uh, 2004, uh, served as a member, participated as a member of the National Consortium of Violence Research, um, an eclectic group of scholars from any, any number of disciplines. Uh, from 1998 to 2005. Is that when that ended? 2005. I'm not sure exactly when it, it sort of it kind of tailed down. down. Yeah. It was mostly on Al's energy. Yeah, Al uh, Bloomstein, of course. Uh, in terms of the, his contributions to the American Society of Criminology and what kind of uh, sparked this visit here to College Park, he's currently serving as president, uh, term as president here in this year, of the American Society of Criminology, having served earlier as vice president elect in 2009. Uh, he lists as his fields of specialization, deviance, and formal organizations, uh, as listed on your CV, but uh, I suppose we'll, we'll table my kind of take on sort of where these fall into place and get your take on that as well uh, towards later in the interview. Um, it seems like you had uh, an early interest in scholarship and you had kind of the potential for that. I'm looking back at your vita and noticing a couple things that uh, you accomplished while you were at Wesleyan. Uh, in 1971 was a banner year for you, named Phi Beta Kappa, named uh, NCAA Scholar uh, Athlete, earned the uh, NCAA Scholar Athlete Award, uh, and the Rhodes Scholarship nomination. Can you give us some indication here in terms I peaked, of... I peaked early. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I just, I was a pretty good athlete. And, uh, okay. And so, what in? I'm curious. Uh, uh, football. Mostly. Football. Yeah. Even though I'm like a midget, so, <laughs> yeah, I did. I even got an offer from uh, New York Giants, and 
And that's a Green Bay pack. So, oh, wow. You know, an offer in the sense that send a letter. With no <laughs> hey, you want to try out? And uh, I, I keep them. They're in my attic. So. That's pretty cool. So, so but I know that was... Um, uh, that was, uh, Wesleyan was a very special place. I really enjoyed My daughter went there now, too, but a very special place. It's, it's, there, were, there were a lot of sociologists there who were very dynamic. Ah. There was sort of a diaspora from Columbia after the riots in Columbia. Herb Hyman, who was a pretty famous survey research guy, um, left, because, uh, left Columbia because his records had, that he'd been amassing for years on the study of blind people um, were burned in the oh, demonstration. Wow. So Herb had it. And he, he wasn't politically opposed, but he was personally uh, fronted. So he left and he came up to Wesleyan and he started a survey research group at Wesleyan. So he had our, our own survey of Middletown, Connecticut. Going Another to Middletown. Middletown. Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah. It's not quite as famous as the <laughs> other one, but, and it, uh, but it has better pizza. Uh, so, uh, Herb, was the uh, you know there's Phil Ennis uh, you know, of victimization survey fame? Oh wow! Phil came there from NORC. So there was this there was a guy named Hugh O'Gorman, uh, Vernon Dibble. They all had sort of Chicago Columbia connections, and they and they sort of gravitated around survey research. So um, that was it. Was a very interesting crowd, and they I think there must have been five people from. Westland that went directly to Chicago. Oh wow! Uh, in the sociology department, because of the influence of this, this uh, bunch of folks. Your interest interested in methodology as well as the, the yeah. The Herb was very. Herb was very. Uh, he was a, a wonderful. He's a little guy, a little tiny guy, but he was part of that Shafe group. You know, in okay. World War Two, and they, you know, my paths crossed a bunch of those people over time, and they were really of an interesting bunch because they had. You know, they had been through the war, and they, they social science was not a joke. Yeah. Uh, it, was, it, was, it was something that would shorten the war, and, and there was a really a, a, a flowering because the Defense Department, you think of them yeah. putting money into, into, mm -hmm. into equipment and things yeah. like that, but here they're really putting it into understanding how groups work huh. and things like that. Morris Janowitz was from that group. All right. uh, Al Bitterman was from that group. All these people had... A tremendous influence on me, I think, and they and they because they they were into applied sociology, Janowitz in, in a military sociology context. Al Bitterman, the same way, did his very famous book on brainwashing, and um, it was interesting. In the New York Times, Al was quoted extensively on the front page of the New York Times about um, he had done a memo when he was working for the Air Force after his his book on March to Calumny and. He was laying out how people tortured people and how the brainwashing fit into this whole thing. It's very Al was very scholarly. Huh. So, and they took his memo, and they took it and they modeled Guantanamo after his memo about you know hierarchies of pain and huh. those kinds of things. Except they left out one line at the bottom which said, "Don't ever do this because no. all you get is false information." <laughs> oh, you know? So I mean, Al was, uh, was so all those guys you know Herb Hyman. Uh, and Al Bitterman, Morse Janowitz, all these guys um, were bringing social science to bear on the war. And uh, as a result, they had a very serious attitude and they yeah. liked applied work, you know. They, yeah. And so, and you, that sort of ran into the discipline of sociology, not in a good way. Because yeah. application was, you know, it's still here, like statist criminology or yeah. whatever they call yeah. that. I forget what they call it. In Britain, it's very. So here, are these were guys who did applied stuff, and they did it really, really well. It's not as if they would just run out and do stuff. Al would always place it in a context. You know, no matter what he did, the first thing he did was review all the literature in the area. It, it looked like you had an early introduction to actually getting into the research environment, even yeah. immediately after. Data, you mean? Yeah, that kind of thing. Yeah. Getting your hands dirty and getting into the field and you yeah, know, no, that's right. And I never quite recovered. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> They say, what's your specialty? And I'm saying, well, it's collecting data. You yeah. Know, that's sort of, I don't know how. I don't know what we do with it once we get it. But it's, uh, so. so, no, it, it, um, Herb Heinemann would always say his highest compliment uh, was clever. You know, see that? Very clever. Huh. So he, he would refer sometimes to Stan Lieberson, you know, the monitor. Yeah. He was at Chicago for a little while. Uh, and I was saying clever, because Stan would. 
understand what you, you know, if you think of ways of measuring things that other people would have, yeah. you did some work on race relations, uh, which is where I started, actually. Uh, it's survey research in race relations. And, uh, Stan, um, Stan looked at census viewer instructions as data, huh. and how the census view, uh, interviewer instructions changed over time, huh. the definition of race. And it's really, it's really quite revealing about. Well, it was, you know, very bureaucratic. Yeah. It wasn't, it wasn't the focus of things. It was sort of by the way. Right. And um, and the, the way people defined race, what percentage of certain groups constituted, you know, the, uh, being in that racial group, and that's very clever. I think. So the whole idea of measurement at one point, I, mean, I just found very compelling. Yeah. Know? And so, and then I ran into people like. Phil Ennis. Uh, when we were in, one of the things we did at West End was there was a, a, a thing, uh, um, uh, I'm forgetting the name of it. Gary Marks did a, a protest and prejudice, was a study that he did in the 60s. Huh. And, uh, he was a professor at MIT. Yeah. And, and for some reason, Phil thought his analysis was junk. So he had a seminar where they, we got the data from him and he just turned us loose on this uh, six of us. And we all had papers picking apart the lists <laughs> and all. And we found all sorts of junk in there, all sorts of things like interviewer effects with flipping the effects going on. And, and the, the people there were, it wasn't just sociologists, we had these like, pre med guys, and very eclectic mm. and a bunch. And so we did these papers, and Phil kind of liked them, and he got some money from the dean and brought Gary Marks down for a Assault. <laughs> so, and we just kicked him all around the room, and he and at the end he said, his defense basically was, "I'm from MIT and you're not." Oh. So, was, so you knew we had done a pretty good job. But it was so that got people all, you know, enthused about the idea because survey methods make a difference and all that kind of thing. And so uh, that was the kind of environment that they, they created. How did how did you get to Chicago? It seems it would well, seem no, obvious. It was like a pipeline. It okay, like a, you know, because Vernon was from there. You know, they knew Herb, and then um, so mostly Vernon Dibble, I guess, was the guy who was mostly from Chicago. Oh. I think, and, and Phil Ennis as well. Yeah, and they so George Surgeon, I think uh, Tom. Let's see who else went there. There's about four or five guys that went there in, over a two-year period. And I think I might, no, Mark Testa. I think I might be the only guy that saw it through, I think. Do you know Mark? Uh, I've seen the name in the literature. Yeah, Mark, uh, Mark went, George Surgeon went, uh, Tom, I'm blanking on his last name, went, and then two guys to the economics department. So, um, so there's a little community, Wesleyan community out there. And so, and there was, a, there's some roots where the Great Brooks curriculum in Chicago was transferred. So there's a lot of interplay between Wesleyan and Chicago. Oh, why? Because one is liberal as you can get, and the other is not. You know? <laughs> so it's, it's very interesting. Um, it's very interesting. So there was this pipeline and in, in intellectual sort of history with those two places. No, what happens with you in terms of crossing that boundary from sociological methodology into more criminological uh, topics? Yeah, I, I think uh, one of, when I finished my prelim exams at uh, Chicago, and I didn't think I'd go back. I wanted to, you know, I didn't, you know. Yeah, there's a gap between your, yeah. your MA and your Yeah, PhD so we had, uh, I went uh, and back, and I, I, I got married. My wife was in her last year of college, and I was one year out, I think. Um, so I, I thought I would not, fi I'd finish the master's degree and then just end it. Yeah. Because it wasn't, it was in some ways too, ethereal for me, the things yeah. that were people were interested in. and the, It was only Janowitz who really had an applied interest, and to some extent Barry Schwartz, who was a lovely guy. And, uh, and um, so uh, I, I, went, uh, I went back and I needed to find a job. Yeah. So, because um, Carolyn was finishing school, and a friend of mine was in the governor's office at, uh, in Connecticut, and he said, we're desperate. Oh, at first, I was going to be a parole officer. Oh wow! So I was all, you know, I was all set up to be a parole officer, yeah. and because uh, um, I had some f friends. Hartford was a small little community, and yeah. I had some friends in the parole. 
in the police. And so they said, um, this guy Pete Siegel says, no, you know, we're desperate to get, you know, they just put these evaluation requirements on our, he, he was in uh, LEAA, the state planning agency, which yeah. is oh, pumping wow. all that money. Yes. You know, one of, uh, yeah. the Nixon administration yeah. pumping all that money. Yeah. And, and Peter said, listen, we're desperate. We don't have anybody who knows anything about this evaluation stuff. Can you head up this evaluation unit? And I said, yeah, I, I can do that. And it would give me more. I wanted to look around the criminal justice system because I was interested in, I got interested in, in, with Barry Schwartz, I got interested in corrections while I was at, at um, because they were using it as a, as a social psychological testing ground yeah. for things, you know. And I like the idea of people and extremists and how they behave, you know. So I got interested in that. And I, and I left my interest in race relations, which is where I, which is where I began at wrestling with the survey methodology and race relations, and and um, I think the so Stan Lieberson said basically you're a white guy, race relations is not for you at least for the next decades. <laughs> so he, you know, I sort of shifted out and started. And then I left and went to Connecticut, and I I got involved in the criminal justice system. And, yeah. And, uh, through this evaluation, and some you know I, I was doing undercover narcotic squads. And, And also some some of their correctional programs. Okay. So I got I got the ability to look under the covers in a lot of these places, and, and um, it it got me interested in those substantive problems. So, so Bob Bursick, uh, in an interview that he did with me at one point, uh, mentioned that Chicago sociology, from the outside looking in, it seemed like to be the epicenter of all the activity at least, and that's sort of the textbook version mm -hmm. that we criminologists have, have mm -hmm. come to fam uh, familiarize ourselves with over the years, but in actuality, he says it existed in sort of pockets, in disparate, disjointed kind yeah. of pockets around campus. Yeah. Is that, is that how, you, how did you piece this together? Yeah, it was, it was, there, there, it was a, a series of fiefdoms. Yeah. And so Irv Spurgle was on your dissertation yeah. committee, right? And he was over in SSA. Yeah. Yeah. Was great. Was, uh, so you, there are fiefdoms that Everybody had their research. You yeah. apprentice yourself to one of the dons, and the, okay. don, and the don would, you know, exploit you for a number of years, <laughs> and, then, and then you would, you know, they would get you a job at the end. They get you a dissertation, yeah. and so yeah. Peter Marsden, for example, who was okay. the chair at Harvard for a while, and Peter was a genius, and Peter would work for Ed Lauman. And he's pumping Ed's books out. You know, did Ed know much about network analysis? Not so much. <laughs> he knew enough to go to get to get Peter, and Peter is, you know. <laughs> Joe Galaskevich and people like that, yeah. really top flight folks, and, and uh, Ron Burt, who was chair of Berkeley eventually, Ron was another network guy, but he apprenticed himself to uh, Coleman. Yeah. So you had these people who apprenticed themselves to various, so in that sense there was a decentralized, huge demography program that yeah. Bob, Bob started with Bogue, Don Bogue, and they would basically be running these massive grants and stuff, so it was a, um, it was, you know, it made sense. Yeah. Pedagogically, but it was it was decentralized. So Bob was in the demographer camp, and and um, Pete was with social or organization stuff yeah. as well. And, and Janowitz had the people who cared about military sociology and applied research. And uh. there, and so there were a lot of Bidwell was in the sociology of education, and uh, so um, it was an interesting place. It was uh, uh, Stan Stan left. Stan Leverson left. I think he went to the University of Washington, but. Um, there were a lot of, uh, Irv was great, Irv was crazy. So <laughs> yeah, <he's not> <laughs> he was, I mean, uh, he was just a lovely guy. He really, he really, you know, he was a, a caseworker, a street worker yeah. in, in New York, I think, in Resources for the Future. I kind of oh, getting it. Monitoring, it was at the, uh, no, this is, this is like a, you know, it's like you had the Chicago Area Project. Yeah. And sort of counterpart, you know, out of Columbia, and, yeah. and Irv was a social worker. Yeah. So we would do, you know, so I, he, he, I was working with him in the Status Offender Project. That, and uh, so I was his, one of his slaves in that. And uh, it was a big project. Matt Klein had the franchise out in yeah. California. And okay. People spread around the country. And um, so uh, in Irv, we'd, you know, we'd go into the projects and do interviews, you know, 50th and State. And Irv would... Irv would, you know, as soon as he get out of the car, he'd sort of put his, take his watch off, put it on his ankle, <laughs> put his, put his, put his wallet in his sock, you know, and he'd go up, and it was, uh, 
So it was, it was, uh, it was you, know, you could find a place, even though applied, the applied stuff we were doing was not central to Chicago. Yeah. Like, that, like stuff that Peter was doing, stratification and all this network. So was it just a, was it centered around methodology though? Is that where the sort of all the roads kind of intersected? Is no, that what could? I don't no? think so. I think it was. I mean, the network stuff was crucial to for Ed Lauman to do his political sociology. Yeah. Pretty much, you know, how do elites work together? And then he did the bar association stuff. Okay. So it was you know network. I thought it would take over the discipline, but it didn't. Hmm. For some reason, and maybe yeah. that it, the math got too complex or oh. something like that. But you have guys like Peter Marsden and. Ron Burr, who were just like on another planet. Okay. So smart. Yeah. So, um, so I, I think that there were, um, you know, I, I don't think there was a convergence right. in that sense. I mean, I think there was. Jim Short always remarks that there were many Chicago schools. Yeah. That there, there was no unitary uh, kind of no yeah, or uniform think, notion. Yeah, I think there were themes that yeah. you know, were, were um, I think that there were. There were themes that the ecological thing never left. Yeah, okay. You know, it infected Bob. Yeah. Bob a lot. Yeah. And he, uh, you know, he really, I think his book in the early 90s with Grasman pulled all that stuff together yeah. and gave it a whole new life. Well, that and you discovered the data too, right? Well, yeah. it's the data, but, you yeah. know, if you th I think about it, you know, I taught a course at John Jay where we, I th would say, human ecology since Bursic kind of thing. And it, was, <laughs> it was just the way that he pulled all this together. And, yeah. Um, and then, you know, people like Ralph Taylor doing some really interesting stuff. And then yeah. Rob Sampson, of course, came in with the big machine there. And he just, you know, that. So he, one of them pulls together the theory and the other guy gets the big machine going. And that, you know, 20 years worth of analysis, yeah. you know, moving that along. It's really, Rob talking with uh, William Julius Wilson at the last community. And, you know, it's, now there are new stages. The world has changed. The ecological processes yeah. have changed. Yeah. And so and he's sort of catching up to them, so it's been great. So I, I suspect that another thing that probably made Chicago really special is that you, there were not only the illustrious faculty to work from and the various, uh, the various modalities of work, but there's a cohort. Yeah, Your fellow cohort. students. Yeah, no, absolutely. You're absolutely right. The cohort was, you learned way more from the, from the people you were with than you did from is that because you're all coping and trying to survive and trying to... Well, it was a ruthless place. I mean, it was, I mean, the sociology department wasn't as bad as the economics department, but they would flunk out a good chunk of people at every, yeah. every exam. And so, and it wasn't a, a sort of a nurturing place. It was, uh, as an uh, advisor of mine said, it was a good place to be from. Yeah, yeah. You know, and you, but you did, you know, you did form attachments. There, yeah. You know, and, and, um, and it was in your little groups. Right. Was in the groups, so, you know, you got to... I mean, it, there wasn't really a criminology orientation. Barry Schwartz and social psychology was probably the closest. Okay. And Jane Oates would tolerate some of that stuff. Okay. Because he was interested in social control. And so, um, but there really wasn't a, uh, because that was such a tiny little piece of yeah. The fact that Bob got interested in it, you know, yeah. uh, and did some really good work. I think he had AJS publications where he got out of there. You know? And he was, you know, because he was doing really, really good work. And then Dave Curry, you know, Dave, had his own sort of approach to things, and uh, the work he did with Irv uh, on gangs, I think, is pretty yeah. pretty exciting. Yeah. Know? And, and uh, so, so there were a few sort of oddballs that uh, were sort of off the beaten track. <laughs> I mean, although there were many, many tracks, but they were there was a small little group of people. That had so I suppose maybe the challenge was to kind of figure out ways in which to make your your interests kind of relevant, or take a tangent on it that would be kind of well, speak to the. I think people had applied orientation. You know, okay. They, they 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 were they they had a certain subject area as a focus, and not necessarily the discipline as a focus. Yeah. Because the discipline wasn't paying much attention to. It, okay. You know? So it was they were really interested in the topics that they were that they were interested in. Uh, they happen to be applied, yeah. and so whereas a lot of sociology was moving away from application at that time. So Bidwell, for example, was Charles Bidwell was in, in, in the education school and in, in sociology, and that's an application. Uh, you know? So he was interested in those. I once said to him, "Why are they paying your way?" I was really kind of <laughs> dumb, you know. I said, "Why are they paying your way to Russia to give a talk on education?" And he says, "No." In a, in a socialist regime, it's really important that everybody thinks the same. <laughs> so the idea of inculcating people is pretty important. You know, implicit dope, you know. Yeah, yeah. So, it was, yeah. so, I mean, he had some application, but it was really Irv. Yeah. Irv and Morris were good friends. And, uh, um, 
so it's really, I mean, it's really, there's a lot of interesting interpersonal. Yes. So I don't think I would have gotten the job with Irv if, which financed me through the last part of my, and gave me my data and stuff, if it wasn't for Jim. So okay. So he was very helpful. He was really helpful to Dave. And Dave was really good to him in his final years when he had Parkinson's. So. Could, could you talk to us a little bit about some of the ideas that you were encountering that you thought were particularly influential in terms of uh, helping you frame some of your interest areas? Yeah, I think that, I think Janowitz's idea of social control, um, sort of a, a middle level kind of theory yeah. of things, I, th I think was was particularly... Was Coleman there too at the time? Coleman was there, but it was a way different orientation. Oh. You know? So he had a, I mean, they, they would accuse the people um, in Janowitz's camp, sort of, would, would really think of Coleman as an economist. Oh. Because he individualized everything. Oh. You know, um, so uh, there's several of his books um, that really thought about social phenomena as, in, as the aggregation of individual behavior. All right. And I think that you know, Janowitz's approach was you know, quite different yeah. you know, to that kind of thing. Well, I'm thinking so, of Gary Becker's appointment in, in sociology, yeah. for instance. Yeah, I remember. Well, if you remember, I mean, Al, I remember Al Bitterman, Al Reese. And Morris Janowitz were roommates in Chicago. Yeah. Janowitz was a professor recent and been one were students at the time. I don't yeah. know how they worked up, but they got they were and they they and, and Reese would say um, there was a there was a uh, there was a, an economist who was published in AJS. He was outraged. He was outraged. You know, <laughs> they thought it was like a perversion. It was just and Al thought the same way, you know, that there was this that that Economics was just wrong-headed. You know, uh, that, that, yeah. that you don't explain group behavior by by aggregating individual oh, traits. Right. So it was very. So that the idea that you have these normative systems that work, you know, and that guide people's action and shape their action. Yeah. I think was was, you know, something that. I mean, it's different than survey research because survey research is an individualistic. Oh. Kind of orientation, oh. but so it was kind of Janowitz's idea that there are these these institutional spheres in society, and that they have. So it's kind of like middle level analysis. Okay. And th those kinds of things. I, it's not a grand intellectual concept in any way. Yeah. But I think that that um, I think that that was very influential, and the idea that um, that whatever data you have, it has to make sense. Yeah. And you have to plug it into something larger than that. And I right. think it's. Uh, uh, I think we've sort of degenerated into into sort of uh, a more individualistic. Okay. You know, you've got a lot of people in rational choice and yeah. in uh, um, uh, in criminology now. It's very strong. People are talking about decision making and all these kinds of things in a very individualistic way. I think it's. I think it's again. I. I think it's wrong headed. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, not to criticize. I'm right. sure they're, they're contributing for sure. Right. I, yeah. It's just that yes. my pension is for yeah. is to look at these institutional arrangements and think about significant right. group memberships and things like that, which I think influence people's right. behavior much more so than in some spheres, especially in the spheres of of of, of, of deviance and chronology yeah. and and social control. I think that there are you know there there are there are things that the that uh, we were looking, for example, the other day a guest speaker came in and they were looking at the homicide rates in Mexico. And you know, people were talking about the homicide rates. And what you see was this: there was there was this massive increase. So, and people were still talking about the homicide rates on an annual basis as if they had meaning, you know. And the meaning here was that the state had failed. You know, that mm. the rise in homicide was just a symptom of the failure of the state where the money coming in from the drug cartels yeah. were buying off the police, you know, there was no self-protection of any sort, and that's what scared the hell out of people and drove down the economic yeah. activity and everything else. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't homicide per se, yeah. you know, and so there are larger social meanings of these things, and sometimes, and this is kind of a measurement issue too, that sometimes we just get focused on, especially now the quantitative, you know, which I'm totally in favor of, right. but, you know, but uh, you know, you have to make, you have to fit the world to the models, you know, and, yeah. and uh, if I said that backwards, I don't know, but, but I think that, you know, 
that it's the social meaning of things and not not necessarily the economic meaning of things yeah. or even an irrational calculus. Yeah, I suppose it's the age old debate here in terms of this interdisciplinary model within the, the, the emergent field of criminology, criminal justice versus the established discipline of, of sociology, right? I think they've just parted ways. Yes, right. You know, I mean, yeah. obviously, I'm in a criminal, criminology, right. criminal justice program. Right. And so, I mean, the whole discipline grew up because of the, uh, you know, the pressing nature of the problem, but also the, the inattention coming from the major disciplines. Yeah. You know, they, they just, they never followed through. Yeah. You know, here's a nice place to test the social psychological theory, but let's move on. <laughs> you know, so, now, whether we become too isolated or not is another matter. Yeah, yeah. So you list on your on your CV uh, two broad interests: deviance and then formal organizations. As as I read through that, your that's work, that's an old deviant. Right, <laughs> 2014. Yeah. Uh, no, it's even older than that. <laughs> <laughs> so I, as I read your work, uh, I see a couple of uh, of distinct themes: victimization. Mm -hmm. uh, there's this uh, incarceration uh, and the incarceration boom and all the the things that are kind of bound up in that larger issue. Uh, for lack of a better term, uh, data, uh, and then cross-national and comparative, uh, comparative work as well. Uh, it, uh, correct me if I'm wrong if I'm overlooking a, a theme here, but I, I kind of want to get your take in terms of whether or not th those are all part of one larger well, you question. Much, you did a much better job <laughs> summary. No, I mean, these are all, um, well, they tend to blend together in a way. I mean, uh, I remember talking, about, talking to Al Bitterman about his job. Yeah. And you know, I said, Al, what was your first job in the military? He said. Um, I was a motorcycle cop, but I kept falling off my motorcycle. So I, then he said, then my next job was trimming stumps. And I said, oh, an arborist. I said, no, he would cut the gangrene off the stumps, you know, people's uh, amputated limbs. And I said, geez, Al, that's the worst job in the world. You know? and, and he said, well, you can get used to anything in a couple of days. That's the problem. You know, oh. that human beings can get used to anything. So where somebody starts, to, I said, why, you know, how did you end up in survey research? And he said, well, interrogating prisoners in World oh. War II. Because if you ask somebody the right way, you'll always get the answer. Yeah. And so that was his idea about interrogation and torture oh. and all of us. These things. So they all sort of schmush together, you know. <laughs> but one leads to another, to yeah. another, to another. And so I think... I don't want to use the term intellectual because it's you know it's a little grittier and not quite as grandiose as that. But but you start in one place and mm -hmm. it just brings you to another place. And so I think that I think that um, you know, I, I do. I am very interested in measurement. Yeah. You know, I'm interested in data. I'm interested in the social organization of of data collection. It's yeah. a very, I mean, it's, yeah. I mean, talk about putting a glaze on your eye, like a yeah. vase. Yes. It's sort of, it's pretty yeah. boring. But I think it's really crucial. So I've gotten much more interested in that. I mean, I got interested in the social organization survey because that's the error structure. Of the, oh. And so all those things sort of get mushed together. Yeah. Uh, and, and so I, I do have a, the, the two things, the idea that, the, that how things are organized socially is going to affect the kind of data that you get, All right. you know, and so, um, you know, in terms of, and but also in terms of, there's sort of, so that is a strong theme, which you correctly identify, and these other things about the social organization, the criminal justice system, uh, and the role of coercion. Yeah. So you know, um, I think those are that's another kind of theme that's, um, uh, and the the victim surveys, you know. It's part of the interest in survey research yeah. and everything else. But then, you know, once you're there, you become yeah. the victim survey can tell you a lot. It's a big net that you drag through society for thirty or forty years. Yeah. It can tell you a ton of stuff about the way people are organized, you know, and the way their organization affects their commission of crime and and their uh, uh, and their experience as a victim. So, I mean, they're kind of loosely connected. Yeah. You know, so that I, I'll look for things in the survey that are indicative of participation in larger social units, and then try and see how those units affect the risk behavior. So, so all I don't know if I uh, that was at all coherent. But so, what allows you to tie them together? What what gives you entree from? Because that some people would look that at, at that as just an enormous learning curve. 
having to say that, okay, I'm no longer interested in this, I'm interested in this new thing, and now I've got to spend all the time, dedicate all this energy to kind of learning well, about... Well, but that's how it goes. I yeah. mean, you, so, you sort of, you know, I spent all my time learning about survey research, and yeah. learning about the NCBS. Al Bitterman said to me, he said, Jim, now you know more about less than anybody I know. <laughs> so it's just the idea of, you know, one thing leads to another. Okay. It's like a puzzle. Yeah. And so... Um, so, as interested in survey research now, I'm thinking that the survey research industry is going to die. Okay. You know, that, and, and so we have to start, you know, it's on this very interesting panel. What's, what's going to lead to it? Is this big data? Well, big data is not going to kill it. You know, I don't think. But big, big data may save it. Oh. I think that, I think that, that people no longer pick up their phone. Yeah. To take these things. Yeah. Yeah. So, and the phone saved the research, the survey research industry in the 70s. And now it's killing it. So they're, they're trying to adapt. It's an interesting to see all these clever people trying to adapt. And, you know, surveys are wonderful because you have control over the design. You have all this control that you don't have in these other sources of data. But we're going to have to learn how to blend them together in a way that, uh, that enhances both. You now, because by themselves, the whole idea of a survey in the old sense of the word is going to be rare and really expensive. So how do you take something like the NCBS, which is unbelievable. I mean, I, I'm just, the reason this is like some, watching some your kid in Little League or something like that. Is the, you've got this, here you have the citizens have a direct voice, not through the electoral process or anything else. They have a direct voice in defining the crime problem. Yeah. You yeah. don't want to ever, yeah. ever lose that. You want right. to, I mean, countries, so no matter what it takes, you need to yeah. have... Because once a leader says, you know, we're in, we're in chaos here, and then you go, no, it's not coming through the cops, it's not filtered by them, it's coming right yeah. from the mouths of citizens. So I like, I, I, one of the last pieces I read when preparing for this was it the piece that you wrote for the Crime and Justice series with Addington mm -hmm. about the sort of the, the changing, the expanded definition yeah. of, of the elasticity of evil, I right. think is the title of it. Uh, to kind of get, stole, it's a plastic stole notion. It from Albert Cohen. <laughs> if you're going to steal, steal from the best, right? Yes. Yeah. Um, you were at the sort of the ground level when victimization research really began to kind of. Not really. Build. I was sort of on the first floor. I think okay. was, uh, the ground level well, was. Was Hinda Lang? Oh, no. Al no. Bitterman, Al Reese. You know, when you're talking about the, the, the survey, the sample survey, it was. Bitterman, the wow. pilot, Al Reese, 1967, 68, um, and uh, Phil Ennis at NRC. Huh. Incredibly, uh, Lynn Addington knows this stuff better than anybody, but, but the um, incredible care that these people took, and so it was brand new, there was no baggage that they were bringing or anything <laughs> like that, and they thought it some really creative yeah. stuff, you know, and the pilot studies, you know, going back and just reading what they did, because they had to make, they had to demonstrate that crime was prevalent enough that you could measure it with a sample survey yeah. of reasonable size. That's the whole point. Yeah. You know? And so, um, in order for that to be the case, you would have to have a large dark figure. Oh. And so the question is, how large is the dark figure? And so that's where all these pilots got there. Yeah. You know, so that, and then the census got hold of it and screwed up. <laughs> So the redesign, the yeah. redesign in, the, in 1980 to 85 was essentially, if you look at it, trying to get back to the original designs oh. of the pilots. Huh. And take, you know, take the census and stink off. It. That's interesting. Yeah, that's, uh, so, and they've worked really, really hard, you know, several different times. In a lot of ways, I think I, I, I told Bob Grace that he used to be head of the census bureau. Bob was in the original redesign. And I said, you know, I said, survey, uh, victimization surveys have done more for survey research than survey research has done for victimization. Oh, wow. Because there are many really innovative stuff that Bitterman oh. and Steve and people sort of push. And about retrospective surveys and how you ask people to help them remember. Uh, so they've done a lot. I think more than any other country in the world has done it. Right. With the ICBS? Well, I think that, I think that um, the rest of the world is coming. You know, okay. I think, and so, and they've been coming for a while. Jan Van Dyke's been pushing this forever. But we wouldn't agree on the methodological findings, but, but I think that, I think people appreciate the importance of direct participation of citizens in the definition of crime. Yeah. 
in places like Mexico and other countries where the, where the, where the crime statistics from the police are in doubt. You know, that having a survey is huge as well. And not only that, but um, in the United States, because of the particular highly aggregated nature of the police, you, you need a disaggregatable data set. Oh. And so now with the NCSX and NIBRS coming, yeah. which I hope to God they are, and, uh, and I think the resources are there, because people don't miss them. And I think that, um, so now you're going to have a ton of, you know, actually a ton of incident level police data. Yeah. And you can blend that with incident level. Not that these highly aggregated, but blend, yeah. you know, and so sort of maybe even match it. Or not. So this, you know, this opens the door to a whole variety of things yeah. that we can, with both types of data used, weighted differently. So what this will tell us, that we've never been able to do that because the survey research stuff has been not sufficiently clustered yeah. in the sample, and we haven't had the incident of the test. So now, start putting this stuff together, you'll be able to do some really creative stuff about how much is due to place, how much is due to person, and the things that we can't really tease out at this point. So it's a very exciting uh, time if, uh, if people continue with the research. Yeah. There's, a, there's a pretty spare number of theories that um, speak to the victimization experience. I, I'm wondering if if there are additional uh, benefits that it's offered to the field in terms of kind of sparking thought and theoretical development well, you know, as well. Marcus Felsen and, uh, and those guys uh, yeah. uh, really were pretty creative. You know, Ken Land. Yeah. Uh, that, uh, that, that, I'm leaving folks out and I apologize, but I think they, they really said, they took the victimization survey and took a, it was a very little information in the survey at the time. Yeah. And they, they basically um, made the most of it. Okay. Uh, talking about social structural change and, and employment of women and what that does to opportunity and yeah. so on. And still the opportunity framework in all its guises, I think, is one of the better ways to, to start looking at uh, victimization. But I think, you know, if you look at the stuff that Janet uh, Lawrence and Karen and yeah. uh, Obama have done, you know, when you take this incredible time series yeah. and you look at it over time, you know, this is where institutional change makes itself felt. All right. You know? So if you think about, here's a way for you to look at how the public regards the police yeah. over time. And, and in, through their ability to, not in what they say, but what they do, and their ability to call the police. And so, so they did that great piece where they, everybody's saying, well, reporting the police is fairly stable. No, it's not. And you control yeah. for all the other things yeah. that, and that I thought was a terrific point, and there's so many points like that. that the world has changed, you know, yeah. and and with this disaggregatable time series, you can hold constant some of those changes, and and look at things that seem permanent but are quite different, yeah. you know. And so there's so much to do, and that fact that yeah. that you're part of that group too, in yeah. terms of the gender angle. Uh, well, yeah, that's, they're just taking me along for the ride. <laughs> 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 they, need, they needed some weight, you know, <laughs> and so but they but and I look at the stuff that Min Min C is is, is I always mess up Min's last name. <laughs> But we just had a piece come out in JRCD where, you know, she's looking at Sherman's, uh, you know, the idea of arrest, what the effect of arrest is on subsequent victims. All right. And, stuff like that. and, you know, there's some really, um, the longitudinal aspects, Reese was on this early on in the 70s. Yeah. But the longitudinal uses are, you know, Sharon Lawrence and all that. Where do you make them off of it? So there's so much to find out. And, that. And, so, and a lot of it now, you've got this stuff married to the ACS. Okay. So, you know, talking about aggregates. Now hmm. you can begin to look at aggregates. And so I think many and a bunch of people had something just accepted in another journal that they were looking at the new immigration. Yeah. So that you have the old immigrant cities. And yeah. new, now you've got new ones. People are going to someplace in Nebraska right off the bat. Uh, not going to LA or right. Chicago and so and so what is their life like? You know, and so and and it's a very I think it's a very important indication that we've got a old immigration story and a new immigration story. Huh. And their and their meaning for crime is somewhat the same but somewhat different. Huh. You know? So you will not be able to do that without these great yeah. big dredges going through society yeah. and doing it. And so it allows us to take 
aggregates and individual processes and sort them out if we haven't been able to do that before. So, so to the extent that, I mean, one of the things that scares me in the social organization of data collection aspect is that, is that we need, people need to, to let go of some old model mm -hmm. without letting go of the principles. Oh. So the principles of, uh, for instance, in big data, yeah. what you don't know is what you don't have, but sure. Right. Right. And that's what you always had in a sample-based collection, this traditional survey. You knew what you didn't have. Right. Now, these guys have no clue. You've seen sort of how the sausage is made, so to speak, right? It, the world seems awash in secondary data. It's just, it's readily available. Right. And so, could you speak to us about the value of... Uh, well, what's the, what's the, what is the UCR been for? The administrative data yeah. that's been hammered into a statistical system. And now Nibers just gives you more data. But yeah. it's all it's all riding on the back of a, a service delivery system. Yeah. And when that service delivery system changes, the data change. Yeah. So unless you're working hard not, not to have that. So we went out to Google and those people and talked to their people and we said, because we're worried about Google replacing the, the statistical systems for on labor force and crime. So, Google, I, we came away from that meeting saying Google is never going to do that because they don't care. Okay. All right? They don't care if they're making money and they're getting data on the side. And if they need to change this to make money and that's going to alter the data, they're going to change that to make money. Uh -huh. So, nobody's going to replace a federal statistical agency in terms of attention to series continuity and measurement and all the rest of those things because it isn't in the DNA of, right. of the big data people. It's not there. So, and it won't be there until it becomes profitable. Okay. And it's never going to be. Right. So, I think that there has to be a marriage made where their technology and, and you know, so when we mush together administrative record data yeah. with survey data, how do you get the counterpart of the standard error for that? You know, what's quality? What's yeah. good? So these things, because what you're awash with now is, is uh, it's junk. All this, it's fast. Yeah. And it's there, but yeah. you have, it, you have, it's of unknown quality. Yeah. And I don't even know now how, you, unless you did a really thorough error profile of every single bit, which is right. incredibly time consuming. Yeah. Right. There's no way to generalize quality of anything else. So it's a real. Are there institutional incentives to do the pieces like you've done over the course of the years where you say, here's, here's what's going on with the NCUBS update? Yeah, I think so. I think we just did a piece in Mike Clancy and Lynn and Lincoln and I uh, just did a piece for Charles, uh, uh, was the other one, I think it's C CPP, I think, um, on these various new data sets. Oh. I mean, Janet has a piece in it, too. I think yeah. So, letting people know, I mean, the, the, that love. And uh, we haven't trained our students. Uh, you know, how, how do, do our students know how to write scripts, to know how to scrape, to know, yeah, it's, it's time. <laughs> you know, it's time for yeah. them to know that, you know. And so we're still trying to get them to do the normal stat course, yeah, you know, right. not machine learning. Or something <laughs> like that. So, you know, we got a lot of filling in. The world's moving fast. And so you get, you're going to get people publishing stuff. Rob Sampson did that piece in social, I think was social science methodology with some of the students, where they took the administrative uh, record data from the city of Boston. And, you know, uh, what's his name? Uh, Hip, John Hip. And those guys, yeah. he's been mining that data out there. And uh -huh. all that. So and that's great. You get people to start bringing these administrative. We're trying to do it here for the state of Maryland. Oh. Bring together all that administrative record data and, and, and turn people loose on it. But, but you got to, well, anyway, I, I think that's a new challenge for the discipline and people who are data oriented. How, how did you get into prison work? One of the few repeat offenders in terms of your, your <laughs> publishing uh, partners is, is Sable. Yeah, <laughs> I, I guess. Bill, Bill, well, when I got into prison work uh, early on, and I mean, uh, so, so, uh, so theoretically, in the social psychology, um, yeah. people, how do people behave in extreme conditions? Yeah. Prison is one of the oh. extreme conditions. Yeah. So I read a lot of that stuff at that time, more from a theoretical point of view. And then, and then I sort of dropped it. Yeah, and then um, and then later, Bill Sable and I, in 1992, were sitting at AU <laughs> having a beer. I think we were just in the room and we were having yeah. a beer. And he said, "What's the most important thing?" This is 1992. Yeah. And he said, "What's the most important thing?" I said, "Well, I think it's the 
it's the change in the size and clustering of the prison population. So remember, we are just we are five years into the increase. Yeah. Well, depending on where you're taking it. But yeah, I'm saying it's getting so big that it's going to cluster, and it's getting so clustered that it's going to disrupt social institutions and not just. Yeah. And we're talking about families. Yeah. Remember, this is way before the, all the collateral all consequences. The collateral consequences of yeah, stuff. you're right. Because it made a lot of sense. So we did the presentation in Pittsburgh on this, and then we started started working on these things, sort of marching through the. I suppose at, at that point in time, the fear probably would have been that well, you had no anticipation that the crime was going to decline the way in which it was. I suppose. It, no, we had, yeah, right. We were clueless about right. those things. <laughs> but I think that you know changes in the in the in the prison uh, population and and the flows in and out. Yeah. And, its effect on so we we're, were going into the jail surveys and saying what inmates today yeah. you know, you know, is it plausible to have collateral damage well are there were these guys employed were these guys part of families were these guys so simple sort of looks at these things and then we you know, said let's look at community so we went and we got the, we took uh, this is again was way ahead of the, of the curve in that sense of that we got Ralph Taylor's great data on communities. Oh wow! And we're able to marry it with exits from the ball, from the Maryland prison system. So we had this great time series from 1980 to 2000 uh, on emissions and releases and the geocoding. Yeah. So we knew who you know flows in and out and that sort of thing. And then Ralph's data on, on, on it was terrific. Yeah. It was just and um, so we were able to look and we were sort of saying you know. You know, we first our first piece is based on the and the inmate surveys and the NC, NCRP flows in and out. Uh, you know, we're sort of saying, well, you know, there could be some collateral damage yeah. here. I don't know. We're getting down into the community level. I mean, Todd's a great friend yeah. of mine, but we disagree on this 100. Yeah. percent And so he was saying no crime reduction effect and um, and a lot of collateral damage. And, yeah. <laughs> See, a lot of your work in, in the prison uh, vein, in the incarceration vein, uh, is kind of down the middle in a lot of ways. Well, it is because yeah. things are more complicated. Yes. Than that. I think. Right. I think that, that everybody has this idealized version of what of what prison. Right. The comp uh, the comparisons to Russia and, and as apartheid South Africa and things. And well, I mean, early on, that 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 was wrong. Right. You know, that was yeah. pure ideology, I think, and when you took it apart, I, when I was in the Justice Department, yeah. when I first got out of graduate school, I went to the Justice Department because my wife was coming here and I yeah. needed to get a job. <laughs> and uh, there was a great staff office to the Attorney General called the Office for Improvements in the Administration of Justice. Oh, wow. And Griffin Bell, who was the AG and a great friend of Jimmy Carter at the time, that he said, I've got these things I want to find out, and I've got this office, about 32 people, half attorneys, half social scientists. Uh, and so I got a series of problems. You guys investigated. Okay. And so we had unbelievable people. Charles Welford was there. Harry Scar, who was the director of the Census Bureau, eventually. After that, Austin Surratt came as a visiting fellow. Wow. And he's, you know, and, and uh, it was <laughs> more energy then than it was now even. <laughs> so and then uh, you had uh, George Bridges was there. He was my boss, actually. And um, who, um, I'm trying to think. I'm well, there's some some of the lawyers like Billy Owens who went on to head the civil rights division as a as a career guy, and, and, uh, and Ralph Cavana, I think you know, he's in law school somewhere. But there there are some really really smart folks, and JJ uh, Post. And was there. So what you had was um, you know it was a very exciting place. And so Ron Gaynor, who was the godfather of sentencing uh, bills, Ron Gaynor came in and he said, "This guy Father Drynan from." was a representative from uh, Boston who was a Jesuit or something. Yeah. He would come in and say, we're the most punitive country in the world. And so Ron comes in, and I was a lowly intern. He goes, you go find out if that's true. I said, D do you want an advocacy piece, or do you want something straight up? He said, I want straight up. Just tell me if that's true. So I started poking around yeah. with those original things, you know, about, and the data was just not there. You had to piece it together and everything else. Well, th then you, then you have the international piece coming That's what I mean. Too, that, right? was the right. that was the international Yeah, piece. the Germany and the... That's exactly yeah. So they left me alone for like eight months. They said, I'm in the Library of Congress. I'm getting the tabs, the tables <laughs> translated. And so you put all this stuff together, and once you control for arrests and stuff as best you could, yeah. you know, a lot of the effect goes away. Yeah. I mean, we're a, little, we're a little bit more punitive in the property crimes, but in the, in the serious stuff, if you, you rob somebody in Germany, you're gone. Yeah. 
Yeah. If you kill somebody, you're definitely gone. Yeah. And so we didn't, you know, I got called so many names. I remember right. Sarah Dyke, who was in crime delinquency, sent the irate letter to me when I submitted this. She said, you know, you've you've compared the United States to the most punitive countries in the world. You know, when you when you find this in your comparisons with the Netherlands, you come see me. And she just, I'm not even sending this out for review. And I said, Ooh. so I wrote her a nice note saying, well, perhaps uh, England wasn't as punitive when you used it. And, and uh, I cited all the <laughs> things that she had compared. <laughs> oh, so uh, so eventually, the journal of Criminal and Criminology published it. Yeah. So, and I, and I think that that's where the international comparisons I think are. You know, they're so enlightening, you know, that once you can get the statistics straight. Yeah. Well, th it seems like you spend a good half of any given publication kind of outlining here. Here's the definitional issues. Here are some of the measurement problems. And <laughs> <laughs> I told you, I couldn't get over it. You know, I was thinking you get all this stuff and you try and, you know, you try and do those comparisons. Yeah. And, uh, and it's really, really hard. That's why Jan and those people are really doing some... God's work and trying to get that yeah. stuff. Of course, we disagree about how you do it. Right. Now, but, you know, I think that with the UN now has this cl crime classification that they have out. Yeah. That's much more detailed. And in fact, the Modernizing Crime Statistics group that National Academy of Science that Janet was heading up, they sort of embraced that classification. Yeah. So there, there's really a much more detailed and refined classification that people can okay. endorse. You know, and I think that's an important, because, you know, the, the beauty of the cross-national comparisons is that you have these institutional differences. Yes. Yeah. You know, we yeah. talked about the idea of institutions and individual yeah. behavior. That's why the multi-level stuff from the NCBS is crucial because it helps you pick this stuff up. Mm -hmm. And the same is true, you know, we're going to have data from Mexico because the Mexican statistical agency is unbelievable. They're so good. And they have, um, they're, they're going to have survey research data that's victim survey data. Wow. And, and it's going to be all over Latin America because of the UN's effort. I think I'm, I'm being overly rosy, right. but I'm, I mean, so Andres Villarreal, who's over here in the sociology department, was one of Rob Sampson's students. I huh. think he did some stuff with this guy Braulio da Silva that um, looks at so collective efficacy and all those things yeah. flips the effects of collective efficacy and also flips in Brazil, when you live in Brazil because yeah and when you look at it you know you look at those favelas where you know there's you have to interact with your neighbors because your ass over tea kettle on top of them you know and then you go to middle class neighborhoods they all have fences and wires and they don't interact with anybody <laughs> so you know you've got but those are the high crime areas yeah. so when you really put it in context you understand that that these human ecology theories don't yeah. aren't the same everywhere yeah. you know you go to the you go to the former Eastern Bloc, and I was talking to this Polish guy one time, and he said, oh, our, our housing is allocated by law. So it's a random process. Are you going to have any, should you have any clustering at all of crime in those areas? No. 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 Why? Because there's no housing market. Right. You can't leave. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, these kinds of, when I talk yeah. about institutional arrangements, all right. if you're going to slap the s same rational calculus onto this Polish guy and this other guy, in a socialist economy, it's not going to work. Yeah. You know, it's yeah. you got to take account of these larger social institutions. And I think that um, uh, there's some great work being done uh, uh, from some kids at John Jay, looking at Pakistan and other places, and looking at uh, Colombia, where how the human ecological theories fit mm -hmm. in those various places. And you know, you see their dependence on other larger institutions, political and otherwise. Uh -huh. So. Um, I have no idea what your question was. <laughs> that's why I enjoy talking in your office. I think, the, office. I think the, 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 that's why the cross-national stuff is so um, crucial. Because yeah. if you think of when, when you think of Bob Bob's systems theory, yeah. that sort of that he really said we don't know, and Rob Sampson says the same thing. We don't really know what the effects of these larger institutional arrangements are, you know, in on these community level institutions. We just don't know what they yeah. are. And I think that that's where the cross-national stuff could be very compelling and enlightening. You know, really. So, so I'm going to ask us to maybe switch tracks here. Or stop know. even. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Cut. Uh, talking an awful lot about your academic, uh, your academic work, and you've been able to successfully maintain that while also wearing an administrator's hat for quite a bit of your career. Uh, could you talk to us about some of the things that you've done as an administrator, not only in academic life, but you were you were head of the. Uh, 
the, uh, the director of the Bureau of Justice Statistics as well. Some of the initiatives that, that you that you were able to push forward. I think Alan Beck. I know from Alan yeah. Alan does some great work in corrections, and he's also one of the deputy directors for Science Advisor. So Jim, you don't have a career; you have a job. <laughs> and he also said something about <laughs> legacy. He said, don't, 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 don't think about legacy because in two no. minutes it's going to be gone. Oh. And, and so, and he's right. I mean, yeah. everything is so fragile in this end of the world. And I think that, um, I think, you know, administratively, my goal has always been not to bankrupt whatever place uh -oh. I'm responsible. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, I think in terms of, I mean, the, obviously, the chairs of departments are just there pretty much to keep keep the trains running. Yeah. And, yeah. and so, I mean, some people like, you know, like Charles Welfare, I think resources that they that come their way. I think that, uh, so if you're going to do something like that, you better be in there for a long run. Kind of thing. I think, and so I wouldn't, you know, again, if, if I paid the bills and stuff like that, they, you and hear it. That, uh, well, how about how with the uh, bureau, uh, BJS. bureau you have a little more you have a little more control because you have yeah. a budget. Okay. And uh, unlike academic places, when you tell somebody who works for you to do something, they do it. You know, <laughs> it's, there's none of us. I mean, we didn't get into this business <laughs> to do that. You know, so so and that's I think that's true everywhere. But I think I think that the I I really I really had a yeah. I think you know, and I think it's I came in there with four deputies. Maybe Act Three, and I promoted. I mean, Bill, I, Bill Sable, yeah, Howie Snyder, yeah, you know, uh, Jerry Ramker, which a lot of people don't know, but he is a true gem. Yeah, and, and uh, he's built the uh, criminal history record system. He's been pumping out the money and doing right. all that stuff for years. Uh, and, yes, uh, and Alan Beck. I think you had the yeah, and then later on Mike Planty. I think you had these these people who. Um, you know, I've, I've worked with I worked with Howie and with, and with Bill and some with Alan before, yeah. and not with Jerry. But uh, what a team! You know, <laughs> but, I mean, they don't they don't really pay much attention to me, but they they were, pretty, they were just great. And I think that that you had an administration. You had Lori Robinson who, who took science seriously. Yeah. You had an administration that took science seriously. Um, so we had OMB. We had people at OMB in the statistical community yeah. you know, that um, that were great friends in the budget process, okay. protecting us and things like that. Yeah. And so, and so we were able to look at holes in the system. You know, we were looking at you know, uh, and the NCBS uh, it's challenged because of the methodological changes that we talked about. Yeah. But it's also important. And we never we've talked about subnational estimates. For Hundreds of years, they had let the sample degrade to such an extent that you could barely detect the revolution. So we wanted to get the sample back to where it was. Oh. We were given the money to do that. All right. We were able to to test the subnational program. That's probably coming to a close right now. We'll see how it goes. Yeah. And um, so there were a lot of opportunities that, because of OMB support, because of Lori support, and that because of those, I think and. I think my contribution is that I knew what to do. I mean, people, I mean, this is fatal because it's going to sound like it's arrogant or something, but it's that for 30 years I've been doing the same stuff. We knew what the problems were. Uh, we knew what the opportunities oh. were. And the other one, uh. you know, the other one is sexual violence. You know, that, yeah. uh, that the NCBS has been doing a rear guard action on sexual violence uh. and, and getting and getting pretty well beat up on it. And then, but, you know, we invested in that. We invested in the panel and said, okay, how should you measure sexual violence? Because we've got all sorts of stuff going on. Some of them, the design decisions, are driving those rates way up. Yeah. And and some of them are driving it way down. So we finally said, let's take an honest to God look at this. And we yeah. dumped some money. And you know what the result is? We got and they were wrong too, but we got a fish. <laughs> I mean they paid no attention to the cognitive aspects yeah. of an interview. But the queuing aspects, they were right on the money. And I think that that. So now there's no dissensus. Yeah. You know how you should do this, and let's go do it. Yeah. So, so that a lot of things with the NCBS, I think that were good. The other thing I think is the National Crime Statistics Exchange, which was a, a sample-based implementation of NIBRS. So way back in Jan Chaikin's day, NIBRS was supposed to be implemented on a sample basis, okay. and then go to a population basis. 
perfect one. It made perfect sense. Never got the FBI behind that. Huh. You know, they never financed it. No. So we started, when I was there, we started the NCSX, which resurrected Jan's plan. We tuned it up with Jim Lepkowski. And we started using little bits of our own money to implement that plan. So we took, we took and, and you know who else was Joy Frost, who was head of OVC, was the greatest partner, both with the NCBS. She really wanted to find out uh, whether victims were going to serve them and who. She had this great suspicion that minority men especially were not getting any service huh. because they didn't want it and they were paying. Uh, in terms of women and children are much more attractive. Yeah. You know, so, um, and so we started looking at it. Lynn Langton did an analysis and she said, and she was exactly right. Huh. You know, and so now we've got a whole big component that OVC is paying for in the NCBS to huh. find out more about victim services. That's pretty cool. It is pretty yeah. cool. You know, and that, and that yeah, what's cool is a partnership. Yes. No longer yeah. is the victim service community yeah. afraid of data. Yeah. You know, they're, and, and they're willing to pay for the data. And, huh. only, and so there and so and and now it was partly because of Lynn Langton's piece and then this a, a person who's enlightened enough to see the utility yeah. of data. So that's also a, a good thing. And then I think she was willing to help us with the police administrative record data too. So she gave us some money. So we're able to keep it alive. And I know this is very simplistic, but and then Ferguson happens. Oh. And so the FBI, you know, their director says, How come I don't know this? And he starts talking about data in general and what he doesn't know. Uh -huh. And so he basically says to the CGIS guys, I'm going to meet with you every month uh -huh. or something to do yeah. like that, until we get this fixed. <laughs> and so then they're looking around for something to help them, and they see NCSX. So now they put $145 million behind NCSX and eventually numbers. Uh -huh. So we've sold them, I shouldn't say we because I'm no longer, but sold them an implementation plan, a way to get there. You know? And so um, it's the same old plan as you had before that Jan Shake and had Well, that could be your job turning into a legacy, though. Because well, that, that could, could, could right? but that's, you know, <laughs> we've seen a lot of things crash and burn. Yeah. I think that, you know, yeah. it's really the, the people like uh, Erica Smith and, and Howie Snyder and people like that who are going to do the implementation. Yeah. Now, the important thing is that we get the large jurisdictions participating. Oh. Okay, so yeah. that's important. And so, and we've got them, you know, we've got the funds out to them, Erica and those guys have gotten the funds out to them, and so they're, so let's see. Okay. You know, it's not, last time it died because no one put the resources behind it. This time the FBI has took their own money All right. and put those resources yeah. behind it. So if that happens, I would think that would be, I would think of that as, a, a con, you know, I, w I made a small contribution right. to that. There's a hundred other people. Oh, no, if sure. it works, you got yeah. Mary yeah. Lou Leary yeah. and a bunch of other people who weighed in to make this thing stay alive and not get killed by the FBI. Sure. And then the FBI turned, and now the FBI's you know, a full partner on this. Now, whether that turns into a partnership in terms of use of those data, oh, right. that's going to be an interesting yeah. question. Yeah. So the big failures in my part were, I think, were on the, on the court side. That, Looking back at your career and all the things you've accomplished thus far, what, what do you think are some of the things that you look back on with the most pride, the, the things that kind of bring a smile to your face in terms of, I wrote that, or? I, you know, I don't, I mean. Is there is there a theme, maybe, that you, a no, couple I, of papers think, no, in the culture? <laughs> no, there, I think there are, um, there are, Mostly, it's going to sound very weird because papers, you know, I like I, some of the original sort of cross national comparison work I really liked. Yeah. You know, and I think that some of the work that Bill and I did on the, on the uh, role of incarceration and social control, I like yeah. those. Yeah. Know, I, think, I think that probably the, the cross national early one is sort of, a, yeah. one of my favorites because I was so ignorant, you know, at the time. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And it was, you know, it was just so. Uh, is so badly received by people. You know, oh. and, and was it too early, maybe? Well, it was just that, that people weren't really, they were thinking about it ideologically. Oh. And not thinking All right. about it pragmatically. I think that, but I think mostly I remember work, I remember work group experiences. Oh. I think, you know, huh. because that's where you get your energy. Yeah. So working with Irv 
Spurgle and uh, yeah. John Korbelik and these other guys that it was just an exciting time, I think, in that sense. And so, and then I went to the Bureau of Social Science Research, which was um, during the first NCS redesign. Yeah. And you had, you know, you had this incredible group of people. And, uh, <laughs> you had Al Reese, you had Steve Feinberg, you know, you had uh, Wes Gogan, uh, Garth Taylor at the time. Garth was a young guy, but a uh, rising star on the city. Bob Groves, uh, Colin Lofton. Um, Dick Sparks and um, Hal Nisselson, who's a sampling guy, but all sorts of these top flight guys, and you're getting to interact. Al Reese, you're getting to interact now. Some of that was bruising, you know. <laughs> I remember the first draft of the book that Al and I did on the NCBS. I was, it was three papers, and I sent them off to the sponsor. And he sent a note to the. We were connected by an email system. So it was way ahead of its time. It was like it was like ARPANET or one of those things that you know, <laughs> the science community had. So we connected all these research centers, and, and so it was a public thing. So you put something up, and then someone would come, you know, joined her, and you'd go on and on, and then you edit it to a paper. And they had, a, they, I sent these three chapters in, and uh, I'm on vacation, and I, I plug into the system. And this is like 1980, and he said, he said Lynch sent you these things. I find them fundamentally flawed. You know, it goes out to the whole network. <laughs> and I'm going, oh, God, you know. <laughs> and, uh, and I think there was like four typos or something like that, but he really did. He just, Al was a perfectionist. Or something. So, but it was this intense group of smart people focused on something. And the yeah. learning was like a fire hose. You know, yeah. sort of, and the group, of Dave Cantor was there yeah. on the staff with me at BSSR and Howie Wainer. I, I don't think I've encountered a Vita uh, thus far with... Is, mm, Numerous numbers of co-authors. Yeah, no, that's right. I think uh, I think that I get energy from other people, and that's why the you know this I remember the group, you know, the group at uh, the various places where I've worked. That some have had very special yeah. groups, you know, and, and I think that uh, at BS at, at BJS that was true too. Yeah, and I think so. It's really that's what I remember because it's the energy that you get. From yeah. those other folks, and I think that uh, that's why co-authorship is the same. Yeah, I think. Yeah, you, know, you find, you find like <laughs> Dave Cantor and I would do stuff, and I and and I, it was like we fall into a role where I'd say some outrageous thing, you know, based on a little bit of evidence, and Dave would go, "You can't say that." You know? <laughs> and then we go back and forth, and it was. You know, and Lynn Addington is great because she can really, really write, you know, and she. Uh, Are you sure? Are you sure you're a native speaker? <laughs> so <laughs> politely, she would say that sort of stuff. And so, you know, that's been kind of fun. And Bill is just, you know, Bill is just really, really smart. And I think he brings a lot of the econometric stuff. So a lot of the work we did on, um, on uh, uh, incarceration was, you know, some of the he's enlightened me. So I mean, some of it's voodoo, but the yeah. idea of endogeneity and problems like that, which sociologists handle certain ways. Oh, and, yeah. And so he's just, uh, so that's been just the joy. You know, when you get something and you get, and people add value so that every time you exchange the thing, it gets better. Yeah. You know, yeah. That's pretty, Min is like that too. Yeah. Uh, she's just, you know, when, she, when you give it to her, it comes back. <laughs> Sometimes I'm going, really? <laughs> and so so I, I really find that really uh, the most fun, actually. H have you? Uh, there seems like there's inevitably pushback. We all get journal rejects and things. Cool. Uh, how did the landscape of your career? Well, I mean the the uh, the, 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 the prison national, issue in terms the cross of national punitive right. stuff, the um, the um, collateral damage stuff, for all things where you know there's pushback. The, the measurement of sexual violence, there's yeah. been contentious. All those uh, things are have been contentious. I think. About so how how those kind of settled out or how they've been resolved if they have or well the sexual violence thing I think we know now I think we have enough evidence more evidence than we've ever had by the way most of it paid for by BGS and not by the public health people who just knew they were right because God said so <laughs> so <laughs> yeah. that, that I think that that um, some of them I think that's not fair because some of them had experience right right Kirkpatrick and those guys have been in the, in the weeds and, uh, so 
I think that I think the so I think I think we know how to go forward with that, um, and I think that um, I think we now know. I think it's incontrovertible that we are um, we are the most punitive nation in yeah. the world. Yeah. Sense. That wasn't true right back. Now it's true. I think it's, uh, and we're trying to fix it. I think uh, so. So data, I guess the theme would be data trumps <coughs> ideology, or? Well, and better, the other is immigration. The other is immigration. Immigration, yeah. Uh, I th I two things. I think that uh, data can win out. But the other thing that is, this comes from getting old, you know, is the idea that, that um, you got to update your data and your thinking. Yeah. Right. So, you know, Rob Sampson is talking about a new era of ecological theories, taking account of the changes in, you know, the, 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 the urban renaissance can't be ignored. That's totally different from the concentric ones, right? Yeah. So, 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 and so, um, immigration. Immigration, you know, started out 1896, Journal of Criminal Law and Criminology, Red hair and criminology. You think the Irish immigration had something to do with that? <laughs> <laughs> There's this article. It's in there. 1896. It's a, I think I'm that's gonna have to, as an Irish guy, yeah. I'm gonna have to find that. Look it up. So, so you know, you've got all this stuff. Uh, you know, and now and then, it's when the data in the last 20 or 30 years is pretty convincing that you know this is a prophylactic. You know, it's yeah. a, it's a prevent. My mother and father from Ireland. You know, my father worked two jobs for 16 years. He had no time to get into crime. You know, yeah. He didn't even drink, for God's sake. <laughs> so they had you know, this idea that they, they um, you know, they, so now the common wisdom, except in certain, in certain places, is right. that the immigrants, but you know, that's going to change. Yeah. As, it, as the sort of the changes that Min's picking up in the, All right. in the survey, you know, they're, they're, the immigrant experience is going to be different, especially if we start being hostile towards immigrants. Because one of the cross national things that Rita and I did, immigrant nations had lower levels offending among the immigrant population than did non-immigrant nations because non-immigrant nations push these people to the margins of society and then they behave that way. Uh, so it's a whole, you know, they don't have the institutions around to absorb them. France is going to pay the highest price and you yeah. see it now. Yeah. But more in terrorism and other things. So I think, you know, we've got to data, the more data we get, and we have so little. In spite of everything, we have so little. And that's why the, the big data revolution in criminal justice may be a help in this regard. Okay. But I think that that um, data can trump it if people are willing right. to to pay attention to it, which you know, thankfully in the Obama administration they were. I think. But but we also have to update our thinking because you get right. stuck in these. I mean, you know, I'm 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 thinking of immigration like going my way or something like that. <laughs> oh, you know, it's sort wow. of, it's kind of, you know, there's a reference. Yeah, there's. Yeah. No one will remember that one. <laughs> but I think it's kind of a, you know, that, that you know, you got to update our thinking and it get more complicated. You know, there, there's some horrific stuff, you know, this yeah. thing out in the suburbs of Maryland. Yeah. Yeah. But that, you know, again, we're, we're dealing with rates, not individual stories. Right, you know, right. Those kinds of things. So, so I, I think that that would be the message, that okay. data, data counts. Right. But, but You've got to well, update your thinking. Well, that and it's, uh, the caveat seems to be that you have to update the methodology as well. Yeah. It's a, it has to be kind of receptive to new ideas and yeah. new inputs. No, and, right. kind of, yeah. and I think that happens as you get older because you see several different generations of things occurring. Oh, you know? yeah, yeah. So, so uh, any regrets or any paths not taken oh, that you kind of look back on? And yeah. I I would have liked to been go oh, to the NFL. For I was going to say Packers, <laughs> play for Lombardi. It wouldn't have worked. Wouldn't have worked. <laughs> we had there were people. I was slow and small, <laughs> but the illusion of actually doing that, doing something more kinetic. Yeah. The idea that sitting down in a chair is not good for you. <laughs> right. so, but I think you know I, this is a great era in which to have this job. Yeah. Like, you know, because it's. Um, Academic jobs during this era have been pretty, pretty good. You get to yeah. pursue. Joe Galaskevich used to say, "You know, what kind of job is this where they they pay you to look into the things that you're interested yeah. in?" And it's yeah. pretty, it's a pretty good job. Yeah. I think. It's getting worse. Right. 
you know, the, well, the business aspect of it, sort of financing. The, right, and also, you know, the, the idea of universities not really being funded as a public good anymore, right. especially public universities, yeah. and so that, so they're willing to turn the place, the quad, into a tire dump for a hundred thousand yeah. dollars. So I mean, yeah, you know, where where you've got these premier institutions like the University of Maryland, like like Virginia and other places where they're getting very very little from the, yeah. from the central administration, and yeah. so you know, and, and so you're going to have a two tier faculty. Yeah. Have an entrepreneurial faculty, which is basically a bunch of businessmen, yeah. and then you can have people who have to teach forever. So you yeah. have, the 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 idea of keeping those together is not, yeah. which I thought was a good thing. It's not. It's going to be hard to sustain. Yeah. So uh, looking out to sort of the next generation who's going to be viewing this to, to <laughs> give it to give. <laughs> To still pursue this line of work, how this, how would you do this? It is at four in the morning. <laughs> your desperate situation. Cure to insomnia. Pop the video in. Actually, uh, Bill Bill my Bill Sable might be up that late. <laughs> you know, that kind of energy. Uh, how how does one succeed in, in this kind of business? I don't. Really what are the know. tools? I really don't know. I have I, I think I I I have always um, my thought has been you get excited about something. Okay. And then you you pursue it. And then, I mean, I, I mean, in some ways, when you think about you think about people like Al Bitterman, who I really deeply admire, that the, the I, you get the sense that he's like anybody else. It's nobody that's a few people sit there and say, "This is my plan," because you know who would know? You know who would know that this stuff? And I mean, think of the things that happen now at such a rate that that it's that you get excited about something, uh, you you pursue it with passion as much as you can, and then you're, and then something else hits you. Uh-huh. That's the way I look at it. Yeah. I don't think there's any. Some people might have a much more rational view of how yeah. they do things, but I, I always thought about it as um, that way. That if you get you get something that you're interested in, and, and I mean, so interested that you'll get up to do it. You know, yeah. it's sort of, and you just do it, and then, uh, and that's the beauty of this of this job. That, you know, you got. To, or I don't know if you call it a career, but this beauty is that they let you do that, and that's pretty. Pretty cool. H- how do you, how do you maintain the administrative oh. uh, the administrative element as, as well as the you still publish you still publish in really good spots and you're, you're I, uh, relevant research. How is it that you manage that? I steal I steal other people's <laughs> ideas. <laughs> it's, uh, <laughs> Taking I mean, their TAs. Well, and when RAs. you're talking to people and you get I mean that's always again been my because I'm I, I collaborate with people. It's okay. Also, those are the people who are finishing that stuff. All know, right. Otherwise, it would sit and. A hulk somewhere and half done, and, yeah. and it's the collaboration that you know. And I really look forward to going back to the faculty and teaching and, uh, yeah. and, uh, and just working with those people some more because it's just you know, there's so much that you know. You, so, Mean and I are looking at this stuff on, on why do people why do people use victim services? And we found, in, and I'm sure the discipline knows, the craftsmen know. But when you think about these surveys, the craftsmen don't know what they don't know, just like everybody else. So that, but you know, is the NCDS totally not configured to help us understand why some people seek victim services and other people don't? Because it's it's you know, you think about it, it's really been oriented towards the cops. So what do the cops do? Cops come to emergency situation and they calm it down. That's yeah. their job, according to the young people. Those guys. Yeah. That's what they, so. That's how we're oriented now. Well, how do you go to victim services? You say, "This guy's been beating the hell out of me for so long. I'm not, you know." And the cops come and they come. The cops go, but I'm going to do something to take care of myself. So, yeah. d- so that would say, it's not so much this event, but the five previous uh-huh. that, that put you in that situation. You know, so, you know, or you know, is it the density of like Laura Dugan? Those guys are doing the density in your community. Mm-hmm. You know, if there's nothing there, you go to Woodlawn. Victim services, my God Almighty, no one goes down the road long, uh, or used to. Anyway. Yeah. So, so it's the cops or nothing, you know. So there's a whole variety of things to understand about how, and I'm sure the the, the, the practitioners know it. We got to drain as much as we can from them. But so there's a puzzle, you yeah. know, and you yeah. want to, you know, this and some there's a whole bunch of puzzles around, and you and you, and you can. Um, so I don't think there's any shortage of. 
things to do. So what are, what are the things that are currently on your plate in terms of intellectual interest, uh, uh, scholarly interest? I, I don't know if intellectual is the right, <laughs> the right term. I think I, I, right now I'm... In I'm terms of the job. I, I'm really, we've, we've got this data center here that I managed to convince the Arnold Foundation that it would be useful, but I, I think that the idea of establishing when I was a justice, uh, there was no institutional research capability in the Justice Department. Hmm. If you wanted research, you'd have to farm it out oh, wow. somewhere. Uh, hmm. And so, uh, or you prevail upon DJS, which is not its job. Its job is not to do research for you. It's to maintain these statistical systems. NIJ, but NIJ is really e outward facing for the field. They're not, they're not going to tell you whether or not hiring six more U.S. attorneys is going to increase the prison population by 20 percent or something like that. So, you know, the interconnectedness of and the, and the wisdom of doing one policy thing within the Justice Department. So what you needed was something that the people with databases that are there, because you can't collect it because it takes you two years to do that. You need databases that are linked and curated and ready to go. So the Federal Justice Statistics Program is that kind of database. So when OMB says, can you give us that database so that we can plan? Perfect. You know, because that's that's the way you go about planning. Now you can really get an idea of what's going to happen when you add 15 U.S. attorneys and something like that. So that's kind of an institutional research capability. You need that in every state. Yeah. You know, if you're if you're coming in like Pew and saying, let's reduce the prison population. Here's our strategy. You know, they're defining low risk offenders by their precipitating offense. But that's crazy. Yeah. But that's all they can do because they don't have a linked and curated data system. We have it. So then you say, let's take criminal history into account here. Okay, their previous criminal history. And then let's say, okay, here's how we define a risky offender. And here's, let's, say, let's see how well that did. You know? And so that kind of curation of these data um, is the only thing that will allow you to have evidence-based. You have to have that stuff, the infrastructure in place. And Arnold is good enough, I hope it works, like, uh, to, to, to give us the money to try and go around to people and say, give us your data and we'll give you research. Mm. Doesn't work. Yeah. You, know, you have to say, you have to be there on the spot when they need it. Oh. And so there's opportunities, we're looking for these opportunities. Once you get the exchange going, it takes a year and a half. Yeah. To, you've been through yeah. IRBs yeah. and everything else. Yeah. You can't put up with that if you want to have timely data. You've got to have that already done for you. Uh. Which means they have to give you data carte blanche, oh. which you know damn well they don't. Do. <laughs> right, our bees don't oh, do. Right, right, and right. So, how do you crack that nut? Uh. You know? So, you got to change that institution if those things are gonna. So we, you know, we just got a big break on this. So I think it may work. Uh -huh. And that. So, in in the future, I think that would be something I'd want to do. I yeah, think. I, yeah. I think that. I mean, that's what we're doing now. As sure. soon as I drop the chair thing, that's. Yeah give all my attention to that. So yeah. if we can build these new institutions, that's more like activism more than. Yeah. Uh, but there's some technical issues, these blended estimates and things like okay. that that I want to do so that you can take the NCDS and do pretty good local area estimates for the small states and jurisdictions by blending the two, mm -hmm. two data systems. Um, so I think those those kinds of things. I'm, and then this, I'm, I'm interested in, in victim services. I think this is a whole avenue, you know, that to explore about about how people regard these these services and so the police so we're doing some work now, the police you know, the police are crucial. Right. Because in a lot of ways they're the middleman, you know. So but we just don't have this theory about right. about about service use. And so that that I think and then I think um, so I think, I think so I, I there's a little problem. It's not big problem. I raised this issue with Janet uh, Lawrence at one point. That it, it seems to be this divide between the advocates, advocates in that realm and the policy folks in yes. the, the research community. Yes. Um, and I think the pre people like Joy Frost have bridged that gap. Okay. So I think that uh, I think we have to be more sensitive to uh, their industry. Okay. And and I think they have to finally accept data. Okay. No. It was an interesting meeting, I think, with, in, in, uh, and there were two advocates there. And, you know, once you, the, and the data people were just orthogonal. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and so, but once you listen to them, yeah. and you understand um, their motivation, you know, uh, 
you can you can understand the importance of a lot of the things that they're talking All about right. in terms right. of um, understanding the way victims are thinking. Okay. And so, so I think that um, I hope that partnership continues. Joy's stepped down. You know, she's been sick. She had cancer. I think she's I think she's recovered. But I think she's. You know, if someone like that, yeah. you know, would be, um, has to bridge the gap because she has all the credentials in the world. Yeah. About that, and she's very forward thinking. So, I hope that continues. I hope that the bridge to the victim community um, continues. So, you're now serving as president of ASC, and I'm, I'm kind of a, an aficionado for the history of the field, yeah. <laughs> which comes as a surprise to no one. And oftentimes presidential addresses will be kind of backward looking in a bit of way and sort of um, a capstone to many different things. I'm wondering what your take on sort of the state of the field is. Well, I think, you know, the theme of the meetings, you know, I'm way behind on this thing, don't tell Chris, but the, <laughs> the, the theme of the meeting is, uh, you know, it's a crime uh, legitimacy and reform 50 oh. years since the President's Commission. Huh. So it is an uh, explicit retrospective in that oh. sense, and so I think uh, you know uh, Ted Guest and Cynthia Lennon put together some really great panels and some other people that that um, Bill's doing some Paul Warmly. I think I mean it's an interesting time. Part of it's just being an old geezer, but I think uh, the idea that that many things did not a federal presence in criminal justice was not very large yeah. until that time. And then things have changed. Things changed in terms of the availability of evidence. Things have changed in terms of the, uh, the um, integration of research, the, the amount of research being done. Those things have changed. The federal presence, you know, from zero huh. to huh. LEAA, and you can cops, you can just name them yeah. down, the, down the line, where suddenly the feds said, we have a role here. You know, I wish the hell they'd said it with, well, they did say it with statistics. Yeah. And, you know, in 1973, they put their money down on the NCBS. You know, well, now they didn't have control over the FBI, so they didn't, you know, they just left them alone, pretty much, and that kind of thing. They tried Nibers, wasn't ready yeah. at that time. So, so all these things, you know, have, have, there's been an increased federal presence, and, and in that, there's been some very interesting ideas of how do you how do you um, use evidence uh, how do you uh, how do you incentivize people to change uh, so you know leap law enforcement uh, education legal education assistance law enforcement program. Yeah, yeah. so that has that been a major force for civilizing the police in the United States you know, and so, so there's you know the cops. Clearly, that was a Bill Sable did a yeah. big evaluation of that from when he was a GAO. So, did it reduce crime? Yeah, it did. Yeah. You know, so as far as they can tell. So you've got all these interventions. So Denise O'Donnell, who's head of BJA, De Denise really wanted to say, how do you incentivize people? How do I use this money to move them along? Hmm. You know, so you've got this great sweep where people have tried that kind of stuff. Yeah. You know, and so. I think that um, you know there's so many changes that have occurred in the, in the just crime and justice area over that span of time, and up until that time it was invisible. You know, it started the criminology, criminal justice discipline it started. That. Yeah. So, you know, all the states like Albany started because the governor crime problem was so bad. The governor dumped a ton of money. John, you know, Lyle keeps telling me they they had a year in residence before they had students. That's the kind of care and you know <laughs> stuff that was going on, yeah. that sort of thing. So, I think that's a great watershed there. The victim survey started. There were so many things that started that, yeah. and also the whole social context of it, which is cities were burning. Mm. You, know, yeah. uh, you know, people are calling for a commission now. There's no cities burning. Any. Not in the same way, Not at least. Same way. Yeah. So why do we need it? Yeah. Well, somebody thinks we do need it because there's a lot of people behind it. Yeah. And so, what is it? Is well, it I guess it's a that's the legitimacy yeah, piece, right? So legitimacy is right. not pegged to crime this time. Oh. Because I mean, the arguments. I guess I'm stealing maybe bastardizing God and stuff. But if you think of it, and, and Roland Chilton has a great piece in this too. I think that that um, you know, if you think what the, the cops get bad mouth when crime gets high. Mm -hmm. You're not doing your job. You know, they 
lose legitimacy because they're not doing their job. Yeah. Now they're losing it for some other reason. Huh. You know? And so, I don't know. Because <laughs> they've dropped in the polls, you know? Yeah. And, you know, yeah. And, and, yeah. and they experienced some of the greatest increases in prestige you know, early yeah. on. Yeah. And so, I think it's uh, I think it's an interesting time to uh, to ask to look back and see where where have we come, but also to say um, you know also raise the question of the commission whether it's time okay. for the commission and what is it going to bring because you, know, um, you have you know one commission you had no infrastructure anywhere yeah yeah now you got a lot more infrastructure yeah what do you need? This time, I, you know, still the courts are nowhere to be seen, huh. and the courts are, you know, some of the some of the issues about misdemeanor justice and other things, the courts, you know, the, the courts have been impenetrable to progress. We have no statistics on part of my fault, but yeah. I mean, we have no statistics on court, you know, because the courts are not cooperative. We have the National Center for State Courts getting in the way. Mm -hmm. The only time we've been successful is to go around them. How can that stand yeah. in this yeah. day and age? You know, just so they'll have no accountability statistics in the courts. Huh. Measures for justice, which Amy Bach is, yeah. is shepherding, I think. Is, uh, so it's time to look under the covers because the courts, especially the misdemeanor courts, are causing a lot of, a lot of yeah. you know, some. So some of the legitimacy issues that you're talking about may be coming out of those courts and people's contacts with oh. those courts. All right, and so. Mm -hmm. Jails are stressed, yeah. you know, so we're, we're going to de-incarcerate. Yes, yeah. but who's going to catch it? You know, is it the jails? So it may be that I would, if I said that, a commission on de-incarceration would be yeah. interesting because it, it's going to involve everybody and how do we do it. So I, don't know, it's, I think <laughs> it's so I don't know if that gives you a sense. Of, yeah. Well, it seems, it seems like there's always an emerging question. I think that's one of the exciting parts. Of yeah, I just think we have, to, we have to take stock every once in a while. This, okay. And because yeah. of the 50th anniversary kind of thing, yeah. this is a good time to take stock. And yeah. besides, we're losing everybody. Yeah. You know? I mean, well, the, the founding generation. Yeah. Has, has I mean, they had a 30 year member of member B. Yeah. But Al Reese was quite sick at the time. And, but you had Al Reese was there, and you had Al. Right. Al Bitterman and Al Bloomstein. Yeah. You had a lot of people who were around, you know, and, and, uh, and so you, you could, because things look different. When I spin out my stories, because I was like in high school, and, this was, and I spin out my stories, yeah. and Al Bloomstein goes, who was here? He goes, no, that's not it. <laughs> you know, that's crazy. Where'd you have, what comic book did you? He didn't say this because he's too yeah. nice a guy, but he just, uh, he would just, um, that's not yeah. it, you know. Well, that the field looks much different to, to folks of my generation than it does. Yeah, to, I, can I was imagine. trained in a completely different vernacular. Yeah, uh, I can imagine. So that's, that's and we can, I can't appreciate that until you know, right. someone really lays it out for me. It's yeah. Really, uh, so I don't know. It's uh, I think it's time to take a look back. Sometimes yeah. some of it may be, may be self serving and, and too academic and dry. But I think it, it would help people to know that when they start, they look at today and they think. Here's De, you know Denise O'Donnell trying to use her money for good purposes, yeah. trying to move the country along. And other people have tried the same with the loop stuff and everything else. And you know, in some cases they they did, yeah. you know. And I think in other cases they didn't. Yeah. And, uh, so it's just um, I, I uh, yeah I think it's I think it'd be it's kind of I hope it would be fun, yeah. you know, not too boring. Sure. Yeah, but most people are pretty pretty well drunk after the second day. So. <laughs> that helps. We'll have a lot of misdemeanor sure. arrests of our own. I think it's so I've asked questions about sort of what the field is asking. Uh, uh, in conclusion, I always like to ask if uh, if there's anything that you think I we may have left out of the uh, the record of the conversation here that, that needs to be you've, included. You brought, you brought more to this than I did. You summarized <laughs> it. I'm still I'm going to you know sit here and try and figure out why the hell did I do that? <laughs> right. You have to have a retro you know, right. sort of a rationale for this. Thing. Right. It's not, right. It's it's just uh, it's great to be able to take this an opportunity yeah. just to think about it. Yeah. I never really do think about it. Sure. But, uh, how things happen. Yeah. Know? Now I've got to figure in some, like I say, rationales for some of those gaps. Because you know? <laughs> right. I like donuts, you know. <laughs> <laughs> right. 